Second Sunday in Lent. We begin on page 185 with the words of the grace, which draw us together into this long dance. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Almighty God, you are our all hearts are open, for all desires known, and bring you in us.
Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Ur, 
that he's had to split up all his goods. Remember, he has so much cattle, so many grazing herds, that they're overgrazing on the land, and the land can't support them. So he says to his nephew Lot, who has come with him, take half of all my stuff, and where would you, you can have any pasture land you want, what would you like? So Lot makes his choice, Abram takes the remainder, and off he goes. But now he's concerned because he continues to amass things. He's also concerned because he's not certain he's able always to manage the situation to his advantage. Just prior to this little piece of Genesis, he has gone as far as Egypt, but we know he's taken a new turn to come back. Why? Because when he got to Egypt, he came up with a great scheme. Do you remember his scheme? He turns to his beautiful wife, Sarah, and says to her, Tell people you're my sister. He does this because he's afraid someone's going to kill him and steal his wife. So he goes, just tell people you're my sister. And what happens is Pharaoh lays eyes upon his sister and thinks she's so attractive, he brings her into his harem. And then bad things began to happen in Egypt. So Pharaoh quickly figures out something's not right. And Abraham has to confess to him, well, actually, she's my wife. So he has to make a speedy exit. A U-turn out of Egypt. And on the way, he ends up in a mixed up in a big war with four kings. He finds his nephew Lot has been captured. He has to negotiate his release. Life has been, been a bit choppy for April. It just it hasn't really gone as smooth. Things were going so well. He had big herds, lots of stuff, and all of a sudden things are looking a little rocky in his personal and professional life. So at this point, his mind is fixed only on his family and his goods. And he doesn't have an heir. So the Lord says to Abram, look, I'm going to give you descendants that you can't even imagine. He goes, Lord, uh, you know, who cares? I need an heir. But, he keeps saying but, he says, uh, Abram, I'm your shield. Your reward is going to be great. Can't tell you what it is, but it's going to be a great reward. Abram goes, uh, no, but Lord, what will you give me? I continue childless. And Abram says, the Lord says, Abram, don't worry. I'm going to give you lots of offspring, he says. And he says, but Lord, how am I to know? And he says, you know, don't worry. Look, look, look at this. He goes, all right, let's make a deal. Let's make a covenant. Bring me these animals for sacrifice. And the sacrifice that occurs now is the typical way in those times of making a covenant. All the animals that were brought were cut in half and were placed in a row facing each other. And the two people making the covenant walked between the cut up animals, literally cut a deal, cut a covenant. They walked between the dead animals and the blood of the animals signified a, a life force that bound them in this covenant. So if it was just me and Ted, equal, we would make our deal, and it would be done. If it was a king and a subject, or a suzerain and a vassal, the greater power would begin by articulating all the wonderful things that he had done. And we see this in this particular covenant making. The Lord says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out who did this with mighty acts. And then the vassal, or the inferior person, would then have to pledge what they were going to do in return in this covenant, and what would be the penalty if they failed to perform. But this covenant that God makes with Abram is different, because Abram is not a participant. God is the covenant in himself. He passes alone between the sacrificed animals. He alone makes the promise. He alone offers the conditions and asks for nothing back from Abram. Abram, we know if we read Genesis, does not really respond in a renewed faith in God. He tries on the, my wife is really my sister thing again, and gets in worse trouble. And he continues to stumble and fall as he tries in his progress. But at some point, we know Abram makes 
his commitment to God. He accepts God's offer of a special relationship with him in which God is going to produce a chosen, set apart, special people. And how do we know that Abram changes? Anybody know? Abraham. Yes, Kurt. He changes his name. He is no longer Abram, which means God is all. He becomes Abraham, father of a multitude. Once he accepts God's offer to him, he receives his new name in God, and his bond, or his fetter, as the word covenant means in Hebrew, is made firm. He accepts the relationship God offers to him and accepts his part in becoming the father of a great nation. Now Jesus has made an offer again today as well. Herod's chasing him down once again. But the Pharisees, who are his enemies, come and say, we can help you. Come with us, don't worry, we can help you escape. But Jesus has heard that voice before, hasn't he? He's heard that voice only a few brief weeks before in the desert. The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, God should be helping you out. But since he isn't, I'll help you out. You can turn those stones to bread. You can throw yourself down from the temple. You can have all the world offers you. It's mine to give you. But Jesus knows that it's not safe to offer him. And he knows safety is not Herod's to offer him either. Because he has made his commitment to the Lord. He has received in his baptism his new self. He is now in relationship with God. God is his father. And God has a plan. Jesus. And he knows it is not within Herod's power to divert him from the plan God has for him to enter into the special relationship he has with God. And so he puts him to the side. He says, I have a ministry. I have a mission. I have a task to perform. And God will decide when I have accomplished it and God will decide what happens next. Jesus knows that God has the power to offer him something that is greater than anything earthly Herod could possibly propose. Paul reminds us today that like Jesus in our baptism, we are changed. We enter into a new relationship with God. God makes an offer to us of eternal life. When we are baptized, when we witness a baptism, one thing you should notice, no one receives a surname in baptism. They receive their Christian name. The priest doesn't say, I baptize you, Elizabeth Jane Hardy. He says, I baptize you, Elizabeth Jane. Because it doesn't matter who our earthly father is. God becomes our father in baptism. We have the new name. It's Christian. It's a follower of Jesus Christ. That is our identity. And Paul reminds us our citizenship isn't here. Life is short. This life is short. This life will come to an end. But he says our citizenship, or other translations say our commonwealth, our homeland, is in heaven. He isn't here. Don't waste your time, Paul says, worrying like Abram did about the things of the here and now. The things we think we must have. The offers we accept that imperil our soul. 
who could possibly, that could possibly lead to our destruction, Paul suggests. Fix your minds on that place that you have now been given citizenship to. Place your mind on those things in heaven. Whatever comes to you on offer in this life will not go with you into the next. Our citizenship, our commonwealth, our homeland is in heaven. Just like Abram, just like Jesus, our name has changed. We have become Christian, follower of Christ. As Jesus says to us today, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Our response to God's presence with us in his words of our confession of faith. In the words of the Apostles' Creed on page 189, let us confess the faith of our baptism as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, greater than the earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose to him. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life of the Lord. With confidence and trust, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. For the one holy Catholic and apostolic church throughout the world, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. In the worldwide Anglican communion, we pray for the Diocese of Alwell, the province of the Episcopal Church of South Sudan, for their primate the Most Reverend Justin Batty Arma. In our diocesan prayer cycle, we pray for the Oshawa Deanery. And for our own parish family members, we remember this week, Eleanor and Charles Weller, Nancy Allen, Shirley and Anita Barnes. We pray for Trillium Mono, for St. Mark's in Orangeville, and we remember Randall Shea in the Santa Maria School. In the world, we remember the people and the leaders of the Ukraine. For the people of Afghanistan, especially women and girls. For all victims of violence. For truth and reconciliation. For a stable government in Haiti, for all refugees and asylum seekers, for the unhoused, for the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For those preparing for baptism, for their teachers, and sponsors, we pray to you, Lord, the Lord have mercy. for peace in the world, that a spirit of respect and reconciliation may grow among nations and people. We pray to you, Lord, the Lord have mercy. for the poor, the persecuted, the sick, especially remembering Bishop Michael Polisso, Hillary Brinton, John Banza, Frank Priscilio, Ivy Glenworth, Logan McCaughey, Laura Crosby, 
for Michelle, Debbie White, Charles Weller, Delano Zalonik, for Shirley Burns, Anthony Ketchum, Ron Coles, Margaret Deves, for Bill, Audrey Lees, Betty French, Peter Rhodes, Harry French, Marilyn Taylor, Christopher Franklin, for all who suffer, for refugees, for prisoners and all in danger, that they may be relieved and protected. We pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all whom we have injured or offended, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For grace to amend our lives and to further the reign of God, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Gracious God, you have heard the prayers of your faithful people. You know our needs before we ask, and our ignorance in asking. Grant our requests as may be best for us. This we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Continuing on page 191, your friends of Christ. God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He well considers and invites us to his table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and in all our glory and by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our own. We have not all our neighbors as ourselves. We are Jews and sorry, and we come from your hand. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us in your days, that we may be made delight in the world, and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all ways, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said to his disciples, My peace I give to you. My peace I mean with you. Not as the world gives, I unto you. The peace of the Lord is always with you. Let's greet one another in the name of Christ. Peace be in us.
Guide us to your glory. We ask this in his name. Amen. A Eucharistic prayer is prayer three on page 198 with the preface for Lent on page 220. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of heaven and earth. We give you thanks and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord, who was tempted in every way it did not sin. By his grace, we are able to triumph over every evil and to live no longer for ourselves alone but for him who died for us and rose again. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all who have served you in every age, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name.
we break this bread. Let your church be the wheat which bears its fruit and die. If we die in him, we shall never in him. If we hold firm, we shall remain in him. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. How dare they who are called to his suffering? The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
share in the life to come. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We conclude with the prayer of the law on page 214. All yours, praise you, O Lord. And your faithful servant bless you. Gracious God, we thank you for leading us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. May we who share his body live his new life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We who the spirit of life to give life to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so that we and all your children shall be free. And the whole earth will be for days to remain. We pray Christ our Lord. Amen. Be steadfast in faith, joyful in hope, and untired in love all the days of your life. And the blessing of God, and of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and those you love, here and in paradise, now and forever. Amen. Have a safe and blessed week.